In our last video, this corner here is one of the two corners that we looked at uh, where Barnett's was. And uh, I found this, uh, this short film clip that I want to show you in my files that I uh, neglected to put on last time. thought you might be interested uh, to see what Barnett's looked like, uh, both in the daytime and at night. Here it is. This is a home movie clip that was made by Donald Boyd. And these uh, floats would just get out of the way, you get a pretty good look at Barnett's. And you'll see a better view here in just a second. Here you get a view of the old People's Bank building. And here we are at dusk, you can see the Barnett signs uh, are lit. And here it's pretty dark, this is what that corner looked like at night time. No, we're not starting over. Uh, but we are going to look at this uh, block, the 900 block on the west side, right about where this big cement box is. This is what the west side of Military Street would have looked like back in the early 1800s. Mostly all wooden structures. And this is an artist's version of what Portrain looked like in 1867. And you can see where these two arrows are. Those are the two corners that we looked at in our last video. I believe those are the same buildings that we also looked at. You can see the west side of military uh, looked like it was all wooden structures other than the, the corner building. Uh, mostly it looked like houses with storefronts and they probably lived in a lot of them right there on the premises. I especially like the 900 block of military street. I'm especially fond of the west side of the street. There were so many beautiful buildings in this block. Well, let's just take a couple minutes and look at these uh, next couple of photos. We'll go into the individual buildings when we're done, but just to give you a feel for the architecture of this block. I especially like this photo looking uh, north on the military because it's a high definition photo and uh, as you see later on we can get pretty close on these photos and give you a real good idea of what the architecture looks like. When Lowe's Dorford Drug Store was on the corner here uh, there was another store right next to it, a very small store. Uh, it was under the two windows right next to the bay window. This was occupied by F.M. Taylor. He was a, a dealer in a complete line of shelf and heavy hardware. Also sold stoves and tinware. In other words, he was a tinsmith. And right next door was occupied by J.A. Davison Company. This originally was two smaller stores and he combined it into one large store, 905 and 907 Military Street. This brochure from 1900 gives some really good pictures of this store. And I'll read you some excerpts uh, from what it says about this store. J.A. Davison and Company. Large double store at 905 and 907 Military Street. Occupied by James A. Davison and Company. is one of the prettiest places in Port Huron to visit. The first floor contains a drapery and carpet and rug departments. Also the big wallpaper department, which is acknowledged to be one of the finest departments of its kind in the state. The second floor is occupied by the China department, which cannot be excelled in excellence of stock. Here is found the famous Rookwood Pottery. This pottery ranks with the best productions of pottery in the world, and specimens have lately been placed in many of the museums of Europe. The article goes on to uh, talk about the fine china that they have from France and represented in the dinnerware department and sold by the piece or set. They also had Bohemian and Venetian cut glass of the very finest selections. 
To the right on the second floor is the lamp department, in which can be found everything from the low squat to the banquet and reception lamp. Shaving dishes and five o'clock teas are also sold here. So I think it was quite an impressive store for that day and age. J.A. Davison was at that location until the early 30s, and then uh, later in the 30s, uh, Sears and Roebuck took over that store. Uh, here's a good picture of it right here. I remember as a child walking in there around Christmas time to see Santa, and they didn't really have a real Santa there. They had an animated figure inside a dollhouse, house, which was supposed to be the North Pole. And I would call up on the phone, and he would pick it up inside the North Pole, and I would give him my list of what I wanted for Christmas. Of all the Santa experience, that one sticks out, I think, most in my mind. Sears was at the location until they built their new one uh, on the corner of uh, Ford and uh, Grand River. In the 1960s, United Mills Department Store was there, and later on, I believe it was the 70s, Ben's Furniture Store was there. And you can see by this photo that the bay windows are no longer there and it's been completely covered with a new facade. This photo here gives you an idea of what this block looked like when Ben's was there. If we walk next door to the south, we find ourselves in the Opera House building. At least when it was still there. Notice the building seems to be divided into three sections. You can see the three distinct uh, roof lines uh, at the top. And the section on the right would have been right next door to Sears and Ben's, uh, whatever was there at the time. This is the earliest picture we have of the Opera House. We can't really tell what business was in that section at the time, but we can in the next uh, photograph that we have. Let's take a look at this one a little bit more carefully. In this photograph, you can see it being used as a relief committee headquarters during the Great Thumb Area Forest Fires of September of 1881. We talked about this in a previous video. And you can see the folks here lining up to take the supplies up to the thumb which were much needed. This photo here gives you a good view of the building. You see the four-story center section along with the three-story wings on each side. And, uh, also gives us a look at this building that was just south of Sears and Ben's, which was part of the Opera House uh, in this era, and that was the Port Huron Savings Bank. You can also see the barber pole, and there was a barber that was located in the basement. You can see the railing and the stairs going down in front of the bank. A lot of folks think that the Opera House was uh, building just for the Opera House, but in fact it had uh, several things in it, the bank being one of them, and also you see the retail stores as well going along the ground level. And really the only uh, thing that would uh, show that it was uh, for the Opera and theater would be this sign coming out from the building, and then there's a staircase there, and that, uh, that staircase would take you to the actual Opera House. This picture also shows that David McTaggart Company occupied uh, the south end of the Opera Building. So McTaggart's was around for a really long time. But like any location, businesses came and went. I don't know if you noticed in the last photograph, the southern end was uh, occupied by a shoe store according to the awning. And later on, uh, the St. Clair County Savings Bank was on the south end, so they had a uh, bank in each wing. And the upstairs uh, had offices, and also uh, had dentists in there. You can see by the sign it says, Dental Rooms. Always a pleasant experience, especially way back then. Daniel Harrington opened his new opera house on a Monday evening, November 22nd, 1875. And he hired some amazing talent to come in for the stage plays. Names that we wouldn't recognize today, but in their day they were quite famous. Playing in New York and Philadelphia and, and other large cities. An article written back in the 1800s, just about the opening time of the Opera House, said this. 
Daniel Harrington had hired unquestionably the strongest dramatic combination that had ever visited the West up to that time. The company included within its membership Mrs. D. P. Bowers, the veteran actor. She was in the opening play, The Hunchback, where she played the role of Julia. The second night in Shakespeare's great tragedy Macbeth, she played Lady Macbeth. And also uh, was C. W. Kudak, who was a very talented actor at that time as well. Here he is in Shakespeare. The man that Harrington entrusted running this and acquiring this talent was Louis T. Bennett. He was the manager of the City Opera House. And it is said that he has uh, turned this theater into one of the finest playhouses in the state and some of America's most eminent actor and actresses have appearances behind his footlights. Mr. Bennett was also associated with the Port Huron Savings Bank and manager of Bennett Bill Posting Company. Here's a view from the side looking north and uh, we can see that McTaggart wasn't above uh, having a little advertising on the side of the building. And then down here below we can see the Opera House signage pretty well. And most of the postcards on Military Street in this block always feature the Opera House. Here's a similar photograph, but uh, here we see the complete uh, advertisement for uh, Patterson and McTaggart. Obviously at that time he had a, uh, a partner by the name of Patterson with him. But it says books and stationaries, typewriters, filing devices, and codecs. Well, keep in mind during uh, the first uh, part of the 1900s, Kodak cameras were a pretty big deal. To think that the average person could just take a picture of someone and have an image that was recorded for their lifetime. Uh, it was pretty amazing back then, I would have imagined. The cameras worked a little bit different back then. They were preloaded with a hundred uh, pictures and uh, then you could reload them, but you had to send them back to the factory in order to do it. Not just the film, but the whole camera had to be sent back. And then to reload it was $2. And the price was $25 for the uh, camera, so it wasn't cheap. Uh, that was a lot of money back then. And of course, uh, typewriters were a pretty big deal about that time period as well. They were just coming into their own. This would have been one of the uh, businesses upstairs, one of the offices. This was an insurance company. And this would have been above the uh, McTaggart store on the south end. And the windows would have been overlooking Military Street. Wright Hoyt and Company Insurance. Here's another ad for McTaggart that gives you an idea of what they, uh, what they sold and how they advertised. It's not a complete ad, but it's about 95% of it. Here's a map of the 900 block of military on the west side, and you can see the uh, opera house is pretty prominent there. And uh, the part enclosed by the red rectangle is all the opera house. If you see on the left part of it, that would be the one wing, and that would be the bank. And then on the opposite end, that would set where it says BNS, that would be books and stationery, and uh, that would be McTaggart's, and that would be on the uh, south wing. And as you work your way down, uh, that dotted line is where the balconies would be for the audience. You can see where the stage and the scenery storage and everything is toward the back of the building. Here are some photos that gives you an idea what the inside of the opera house looked like. When you first went in the door, uh, you came into the foyer here and you saw the set of stairs that would take you up to the seating uh, for the audience. And here you see that seating, you have the upper balcony and the lower balcony, and then of course uh, you have the main floor. And then over here we get a view of the orchestra pit and also the stage. See some of uh, the boxes on the side. This one here, uh, that's above it gives you a better look at the boxes taken from an angle. There's the one on the right. 
and the one above that. Well, this gives you a pretty good overview of the Opera House, what it looked like inside. The Opera House was plagued by two fires. The first one they survived, and the second one they didn't. I found this article in the Sarnia Observer. It stated December 1883. And it talks about the fire, $20,000 worth of damage. It was mainly in the center section of the Opera House. The second fire was in 1914. In this fire, they did not survive. The building was completely destroyed and was eventually torn down. It was the one and only Opera House that the city of Fort Huron never had. Our next video, we'll take a look at some of the stores that were built uh, where the Opera House was. Some of the stores that my generation might remember. <laughs>